Welcome to the first ever episode of Airing It Out on the Fubo Sports Network. Now, I'm TJ Hushmanzada, supposed to have Orlando Scandrick here with me, but him not feeling well. Him got a boo-boo today, so uh, me, me and my guy, I'm welcoming me in right now, the best quarterback coach in the country, Jordan Palmer. Appreciate it, man. I'm stoked to be here. We spent a lot of time talking, not as much time talking in front of cameras. We spent a lot of time together talking football, quarterback, receiver. You've taught me about quarterbacks. I'm, I'm sure I've taught you, you taught about, about receiver. receiver. So to actually sit here and have cameras here and actually bring this conversation yeah. to the people uh, and see how it goes. So let's just yeah. get right into it. Biggest name in football, Tom Brady. He takes a sabbatical. Yep. I'm not going to play. Oh, I'm going to come back. I'm going to play. I'm in training camp. I really don't want to deal with training camp, so I'm going to take a week and a half off. What do you make of it? What do you expect from him? Um, if you're on that team, how do you handle that in training camp? I think with Tom more than maybe any other player ever, and there's been so many players and so many great quarterbacks, he's done a bunch of things that nobody's done, like the amount of Super Bowls. But he's done a lot of things that a lot of people have done, like be the MVP of the league and win a Super Bowl and throw for a bunch of yards and touchdowns. Like a lot of people before him have done that. A lot of people after him will do that. But I think we got to look, and you intimately know this, you got to look at where he came from and the way that they ran the show in New England for whatever it was, 19 years or something crazy, the Patriot way, no player is above any of it. Like he had to be by the book for so long and he did. And we don't know all the times he pushed back and this and that and the stories and Alex Guerrero and Bill Belichick beefing and all. Like a, a little bit, you know how it is, a little bit gets out, but there's always more to it. But for so many years, it was do, you're going to do what everybody else does. You're not going to be any different. And then he gets to go and pick his spot, go to Tampa, has success right away, obviously with the Super Bowl, was it two years ago? But there's just never been a player before him who's earned the ability to handle it the way they need to handle it with 100% trust in the building that when we need him to be him, he's going to be him. And that's week one. So... The, the sabbatical he took for 11 days, if I'm in that locker room, I'm not even thinking twice about it. I don't know. I could care less. In fact, that's some other reps for some other guys, right? In case we need Blaine Gabbert this year, that's some other reps, right? And the deciding to retire and come out, I've said this before. I thought it was genius because when he said, I'm retiring, had he said, I need a little bit of time to think about this, there would have been a ticker at the bottom of every sports show. The, the Tom Brady countdown, everywhere he would have gone, it would have been, have you made a decision? Have you made a decision? He would have just been pestered and pelted 24 seven. It would have been talked about every single day. And instead I decided to retire. Everybody makes a big whole like thing about him retiring. And then he decides to come back. And then people made a big stink about it for like 48 hours. And then it's just Tom Brady's back, right? So it was a way for him to like disconnect without getting asked every single day. And there being like a, a countdown on the screen of every football show. I think it allowed him to do his thing. So I don't really question the moves he makes anymore. I don't question any mo moves he makes on social. I don't question if he needs 11 days. Uh, I think him more than any other veteran player that I've ever seen or watched has earned the right to say, hey, look, I'll be, I'll be good. We're, we're going to be straight week one. Um, I need to do what I need to do. Where we sit today, are they Super Bowl contenders? I, uh, I don't think so. I think O-line issues are going to affect that team more as much as any quarterback in the NFL right now. And the recipe to beating Brady is to hit him. And I know that's, that's not, I hate even saying that because the recipe to beat anybody is to tackle the quarterback and sack him and don't let him throw touchdowns. Obviously, I think we're going to see some real effects of that O-line. And um, contender, yes, I think they're in it at the end. Um, and they just kind of, it's not the yards he throws for and the touchdowns. It's not the throws he makes. It's just that like, they always kind of find a way and things kind of line up for them. Kind of like the way that like things lined up for, for uh, Cincinnati last year. You know, they get the Raiders in the first week. The second week, you know, they're playing Tennessee, which is the number one seed. But like, was that the number one team in the AFC last year at that point? No, it kind of worked out that way, but that wasn't the best team. And then the quarterback throws three picks in the game. You know what I mean? And then they get to Kansas City and it's the first time we've ever seen Patrick Mahomes completely melt down for a whole half of football and just play terrible. Like, so, like, that was a new thing. So, to win a Super Bowl, to make it to the Super Bowl, like, things got to line up. I just feel like they do a lot of times, and he puts them in a position to capitalize on it. So, are they a contender? Yes. Like, are they in my top four teams I think can win it? I, I don't. I think their O-line issues are going to be a big problem. They just did the top 100. 
players in the NFL. Brady comes mm. in at number one. You agree? I don't. I, I'm surprised. I'm wow, surprised. I don't agree either. I, I love Brady. Yeah, I, I love Brady. I, I'm I'm surprised he was the number one quarterback. You know, we one I'm it. one we I'm surprised Aaron Donald's not number one. Okay, we agree with that because nobody just dominates the game. Like Tom Brady had a great year last year and wasn't even MVP. You know what I mean? Um, and I understand it's a different voting, but one, I was surprised Aaron Donald wasn't number one. And I was also very surprised that Trent Williams was that late because I think he's top two or three players in the league, uh, but it's O-line. But Brady-wise, yeah, I'm surprised. Like, no matter what Aaron does, I mean, Mahomes was number one last year and, and, and uh, Rodgers was the MVP because it's supposed to be last year. You know what I mean? Like, last year rank these players, right? Not body of work, right? Because, like, I remember when they did this and Peyton Manning was hurt the year before, like, he was number 80-something because he didn't play. You know what I mean? I was surprised that Lamar Jackson was so high because he didn't really play last year. So I think, you know, we, it, the the parameters for it is what do you last season who was ranked what? I think the Brady it's a Brady effect of people are looking at the accumulation of work or the way that he played at that level at that age. Um, but yeah, if I if I ranked him, uh, he wouldn't have been one. Let's go to Dallas, Lone Star yeah. State. You have in people that have listened to him thus far, and I've listened to him a ton. You have qualities of a GM. You know the game inside out. So Jerry Jones comes out and says, we will go as far as Zeke takes us. Mm -hmm. Is he misguided? Um, is he living in the 90s football where everybody is spreading it out, throwing the ball, and here he's saying, we're going to only go as far as Zeke takes us. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think Colin Cowherd had a great take on it, that it's just that's an outdated approach to winning NFL football in 2023. It just is. And to be able to do that, I, I, I would say you have to be able to run the ball, but that's certainly not the approach that Buffalo's taking. And we've seen other teams. That's certainly not the approach that Arizona's going to take as they've turned things around. Um, and neither of those teams have won a Super Bowl. I get that. Um, but I think it's an outdated approach to rely on one player. Um, now, Zeke's rookie year, that was the best offensive line in the league. And you have a rookie quarterback in Dak Prescott. So if you want to run the ball and give it to a fresh, young, healthy running back that you just took fourth overall with the best offensive line in football and a rookie quarterback you're trying to protect because Tony Romo got hurt in a preseason game, Kellen Moore broke his ankle in practice, poof, we got to throw this fourth round pick in. We have no idea. I know what it looked like at Mississippi State. I don't know what it's going to look like in Jerry's world. Then, yeah, you can go through that running, that running back. But when you've invested in wide receiver – and you've invested in quarterback. They've also invested in running back. But that, I mean, that can't. If, if that's what you're going to rely on this year, you're going to need a lot of other things to go your way. You're going to need an upper tier ranked defense. You're going to need a top five defense. You're going to need a lights out special teams. And you're going to need a head coach who's really creative and can scheme these things open. I don't know that they have all those pieces to be able to say, we're riding Zeke. Are they a playoff team? And does Mike McCarthy make it to the end of the season? I would say no, and I don't know about making it to the end of the season, but I, I would be surprised if he's the coach next year. Um, but no, I, I don't think it's a playoff team. I think the NFC East is going to be a lot better. The, this Philly team, they're going to go as far as their quarterback, Jalen Hurts, takes them. Um, but they're going to be better. Washington, everybody's going to sleep on Carson Wentz, and there's things I like about his game. There's things I think he needs to get better at. But he... He's not. This dude's a lot better than people think. He can play. He can play, right? And I, I still think the Giants are a ways away, but I think they have one of the best coaches in the NFL right now in Brian Dable. And so they're, they're a ways away. We'll see what happens if, if he can, you know, get Daniel Jones heading in the right direction or Tyrod Taylor, I think, you know, is another underrated guy who should, be, who should be a starter in this league. So anyways, the NFC East is much better, right? For the last couple of years, for it to be that down and to not dominate that division – um, with the same players. I mean, they had, they've had Dak Prescott, right? I know he got hurt, but they've had him. They've had Ezekiel Elliott this whole time. They've had these players the whole time. And for them to not, like, take the division and run with it the way that we've seen other people do it, um, I, I think there's so many things that can distract you in Dallas, and there's so much non-football stuff that they put on the players' plate, so many opportunities to make money on a Tuesday. We've talked about that. I don't know they got enough dogs to take it and, and win it. They just have it at key skill positions, but they're saying they're going to go through their running back. You bring up Brian Dable, and I'm kind of just veering off because you look at 
what Josh Allen has done in the last two years, and you know mm. Josh very well. I've gotten to know him because of you. And you just kind of gloss, oh, they got a great coach in Brian Dable. Mm -hmm. You look at the success they had in Buffalo, was it a combination of him and Josh? Was it him putting Josh in really good positions and situations, or it's just Josh, he's just that damn good? Yeah, it's definitely a combination. Um, Josh has evolved. He has, a bunch of parts of his game have, have developed. I've been attached in the media and stuff to a lot of the physical development that he has, but that was a small piece. One, he did the work. Two, that was being reinforced by Ken Dorsey, who was his quarterback coach, now OC. I was being reinfor reinforced by Brian Dable um, and the other people in that room, uh, the backups who've been there with him, his rookie year, Derek Anderson, Matt Barkley these last few years. Davis Webb played a role in that. Mitch Trubisky last year played a role in that. And so the development is, is all the pieces coming together. But Josh has unbelievable recall. So when I, I do draft training and when I, when I do these, a lot of times like I can prepare guys for the meetings but a lot of times they'll go into a meeting and they'll introduce 14 people in the room to the young guy and then they'll talk ball and they'll ask him questions, they'll interview him and then at the very end they'll be like, what was everybody's name and job? And I Josh, forgot everybody. <laughs> and, and, and to this day, Brian Dable says the most impressive recall he's ever seen is Josh Allen, which what that means is not that he's good at memorizing people's names. What that means is that he, he can process and store information, right? And so Dable can put a lot on his plate. People don't blitz Buffalo, right? The reason they don't blitz him is it's not because he's got a quick release. Like, that's an element. It's because he sees the field and because they have fantastic answers. Whether we're going to borrow a running back and go protect, and not, we're going to block it up and take a shot down the field, or we're going to throw hot, or we're going to see this coming, we're going to shift to a one-step screen and get a tackle on that nickel who's coming now. They've built fantastic answers to problems versus pressure, so that's why people don't pressure them anymore. So Josh Allen is a big reason for that. He's the guy with the ball in his hand who's got to figure out what to do with it. But Josh, I mean, I talk ball with these guys all offseason. The amount of football that Josh knows right now, going into year, I think, five, is unbelievable so you're, coming from where he came from. Because he's so physically talented, this gets overlooked. 100%. His understanding and IQ of the game. Yeah it gets overlooked because he's this big guy that can run and has a It's just easier to talk about the physical stuff, but I'll say he's one of the, he's got, there's no way to rank this and score it, but he's got to be, in my mind, one of the smartest quarterbacks playing football right now. But it's just so far down the list of things that we talk about when we talk about him, anybody, that it gets overlooked. But when you talk to players who play with him, they're just not going to talk about Josh for a minute without referencing his functional football int intelligence and how quickly he can process information. This quarterback, what's his value? What should he sign for? Why hasn't he signed? Lamar Jackson, Baltimore Ravens, unanimous MVP, takes the league by storm. When he's healthy, he's played really good football, unconventional football to some for what they expect from a quarterback position. But he represents himself. He does not have a contract. He plays a style that could be problematic. Why haven't they figured out financially what works? Yeah, I'm a big Lamar Jackson fan. I, I'm a big fan of somebody who does it different. You know what I mean? This game's been played one way a long time. And then we've seen, you know, we've had Michael Vick. We've had other guys. Russell Wilson's extended the play. Josh is running a lot. We've had other people, you know, not the first guy to run effectively. Other than Vick, he's the first guy to maybe be the best runner in the league, but also plays quarterback. Like, he might be the best runner. I know he's definitely the best running quarterback, but... Him, Derek Henry. I mean, you start looking at the best runners in the league. I think there's three people in the NFL who, and you can debate this, there's three people in the NFL who can legitimately score from anywhere on the field. Like at any given point, they might break five tackles and cut it back and score. I think that's Jamar Chase. I think that's Tyreek Hill. And I think that's Lamar Jackson. Okay. You can argue Alvin Kamara. You can argue these, there's a lot of fast guys, right? But at any point can score and has proven that and done it multiple times, Lamar Jackson's one of three players out of whatever, the 1,500 players in the NFL. Okay? So as far as the contract, I hope this isn't some like E! True Hollywood story where we talk about how we look back and we talk about how did this player only make $30 million, right? Because, because he represents himself, his mom's involved in it, there's been tens of millions of dollars that's already been left on the table from a marketing standpoint. Right? I don't think he signed his first marketing deal until it was Oakley that was last year, and Oakley doesn't have the biggest pockets. 
he's not really under contract, as far as I know, with Adidas or Nike. He's not the face of Bose or Beats by Dre. He's not like, so the opportunity opportunities he's missed out on already. Leaving a lot of meat on the bone. Yeah, it's not like he like, could have made 300 grand last year had he just, no, 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 we're talking about tens of millions of dollars, right? Especially when you look at those marquee players, like when you see a Tom Brady, what is it? Uh, it's not Fantex, whatever his, the, the crypto thing he's doing. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, that's an equity deal. You know what I mean? Like, like Steph Curry's Asking not doing cash deals anymore. Deals and- yeah, it's equity deals. And so if he's not even getting the regular deal, he's definitely not getting those. And, you know, who's played better through their first three seasons? Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen? Josh popped off in year three. Completed 69.8% of his passes. Took the world by storm. That next July signs the biggest deal in the league. Well, Lamar had already won an MVP, right? I'm not comparing the two players. I'm just saying, like, like Josh's body of work through three seasons. Lamar was better. Lamar had done more. And, I, you know, I don't know all the stat, but, like, one more games and, like, all the stuff. So, and you can, you can flip it and say, no, Josh did more. That's fine, but it's, like, commiserate, right? And so, like, I think he should have got paid last offseason. So now we're talking about it's, it's week one. I mean, teams right now that are watching tape, they're not watching training camp. They're watching their week one opponent. Yeah. It's week one, whether that's this weekend or next weekend, it's week one, and this dude still doesn't have a contract done? Like, there's nothing to gain by holding out. If he holds out and he's an MVP, he's going to sign a max contract at the end of the season, just like his incumbent did in, in Joe Flacco. But he should sign a max deal right now. Deshaun Watson just got one. Kyler Murray just got one. Let's talk about the Lamar Jackson slander. You got these anonymous, anonymous executives. Oh, he's not a top 10 quarterback. He can win 10 MVPs. He's still not a top 10 quarterback. One, do you believe that? And two, do you believe that offense is holding him back or they're doing what's best for the team and Lamar? I think he's a top 10 quarterback. Um, and I just look at it like, who would I take over him? I don't think I have 10 names. I don't have it in my head memorized, but like, I don't think I'd name 10 people that I take over him. So I, I coach quarterbacks for a living. I believe that the limiting factor in a player reaching their potential is flawed mechanics. Okay. So can you make it to the league with flawed mechanics? Sure. But you're probably not at your potential, right? Can I get drafted? Can I get a D1 scholarship? Can I start on varsity my senior year? Like, can you win an MVP? Like he has. Can you start on varsity as a senior? If you're starting as a senior, bro, you in trouble. You yeah. better start sooner than that. <laughs> I only played 14 games my senior year in high school. There you go. That's probably why I panned out the way I did. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> so my, the only thing on. I got on you is I was drafted one round ahead of you. <laughs> six. <laughs> Just a couple of scrubs talking ball. No, but uh, you did something with it, a little different than I did afterwards. But, um, but with that, I believe the limiting factor in a player reaching potential is flawed mechanics. And so I just see Lamar as one of the best players in this league, arguably one of the best runners, one of the only three people who can score at any point um, in a league full of fast people, right? But I think he's going to lose in the playoffs every year to somebody whose limiting factor is not flawed mechanics because the bubble screens, the accuracy, the underneath, the shallow cross, I think he just, because of his feet, he just misses enough. So when you say flawed mechanics, People that may be listening, yeah. like, what is the flawed mechanic? So I'm not explained? talking about his throwing mechanics, his arm angle, right? He's a little sidearm here. He's a little over the top. But they all are, right? Pat changes his arm angle. Josh, watch Josh throw bubble screens this year. It's going to come out. His wrist and his elbow will be even. So, but it's about repeating that pattern. But watch every single bubble screen that Josh throws to the right. They all look exactly the same. Aaron Rodgers has his own mechanics, and his feet come out of the ground when he throws, and he does this and that. Yeah, but he does it exactly the same every single time. And he's owned his own mechanics. And when, when, when he throws a ball over somebody's head or he one-hops it to him, he in, in, immediately knows the fix, right? And I've gone back and forth with Colin on this, on the herd, because he, he, he was talking about Patrick Mahomes and slump and his inefficient or his inconsistent mechanics. And my counter is like, yeah, but to him, he's doing it very consistently every single time. I learned this with Cutler. Cutler, when I backed him up in Chicago, that ball would go straight down. Like it, his throwing motion was totally different. I was coaching, I was literally training Blake Bortles for the draft the same year I was backing up Cutler. Like I flew from like workouts in Chicago to the green room in New York to go that night. So I was coaching an NFL, you know, third pick in the draft and backing up Cutler and boy, does he throw it different. But what people don't realize is Jay completely owned his mechanics. Those were his, he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what the fix was, even whether his quarterback coach did or not. And I think all these starters that are playing a high level, 
for the most part, they have complete ownership of what they're trying to do. And with Lamar, there's so much bounce and movement to his game that he's not able to get from the ground up to the exact same position every single time to repeat these patterns. So he relies more on talent. Of, any, of the top players in this league, he relies more on talent than mechanics. And I've always said the truly elite great ones, they get behind their behaviors, not their talents. They get behind that routine every day, mechanics, this is the same way, more so than they are just going to figure it out, right? Give me the ball and I'll make it happen. I think you can win games that way. I think you can put up numbers that way. I just think you're going to lose to Josh, Pat, Joe, Deshaun, Russell in the AFC side of things. Mac, if they figure it out, you're going to – Derek this Mac, year. You can just X Mac out. Uh, you can, I won't. Like, Derek, I just named seven. I, Deshaun, we'll see what happens the first 11 week, right? So, like, I just think there's a, a group of guys who, are, who do it so consistently well that at some point that talent, it, it's not. Now, this offseason, he put in a lot of work. I hope that Lamar has addressed those things, um, but it's, it's year five. Let's talk about somebody that I think he's tough. At least he acts like he's tough and he plays like he's tough. Was uh, Aaron Donald. Mm -hmm. You felt he should have been a number one player on the top 100. Joint practice with the Bengals, uh, he out there kamikaze like this is the WWE. What's your take on, I mean, you're a quarterback, but take yourself outside of that position. Joint practices, what he did, um, what you think? Uh, I'm, I'm surprised there's not a suspension, but it's week one. Really? They're kicking off the season. I mean, it, it's, it happened at the perfect time for him because nobody cares, Right. Like, when Miles Garrett did that, it was like the Sunday night game or something or Monday night. It was a game. It was a game. It was live. We saw it in slow-mo a million times. Like, this is iPhone from the sideline, and there's a scrum. You know what I mean? There's 30 dudes in there, and, yeah, you can zoom in and look at it. It just didn't have the attention and the visibility. I just don't know what the difference is. I mean, that's a weapon. You know what I mean? And so I think a part of what makes him great is his aggression because it's certainly not his size. I mean, I, I was with that. I mean, I was at training camp. Like, you go around Aaron Donald and you look at him. I don't care if his shirt's off or not. There's no way that guy's over 275. It means he's dominating he's at that monster. position at like monster. 265, bro. He, he, Jordan Davis plays the same position as him. The guy's 350. He's got 100 pounds, like 80 pounds on him. You know what I mean? And so for him to do what he does, not, he's not good. He doesn't dominate. He's the most dominant player in the league, in my opinion. Right, no I talk to quarterbacks. Question, no question. They, they're sitting there talking about how they're going to get a third guy, like to protect. So I mean, I talk to quarterbacks about this, and so like part of what makes him great is his aggression. When it's all said and done, I mean, I I'm a I'm like Bills fan here. You know, what I mean, I'm not really a fan, but like want want things to go well for them. I'll be at that game uh, at SoFi. But if they would have suspended him, I could see it because you got to set the president. But at the same time, that marquee player, that marquee matchup, that coming up. Um, handle it internally. I can see how it kind of NFL's like. Let's so you think move he, on with it. If they didn't play the Bills and it wasn't the kickoff game of the twenty two season, you think I, they I, would suspend him? I don't know, but I think if they would have nah, if they man. if they had suspended him, I think it would have been. I think really? the the league, the players in the league, would have been like, yeah, you can't do that in practice. Like we played together. I don't. Re I can't remember how many fights I was in in practice. Just, now, I wasn't I, slinging helmets. I, so I can't either, but I've also never seen anybody do that. And no. I, was at, but I was at the one when it was Martellus and Brandon Mar Martellus Bennett and Brandon Marshall. Martellus ran a shallow cross in practice. Kyle Fuller accidentally clotheslined him. It was an accident. I saw the whole thing. I can vividly remember it. Martellus just pick up suplex. Brandon went in to protect. And, and, and that was like, I mean, Martellus got sent home for like a couple of weeks, you know what I mean, to cool off. And it was like, that was, I've been in some rounds, some fights. That was a fight. That was 270, 230. Brandon. <laughs> talkers, emotional, like, that was a fight. Nothing, I mean, Martellus had issues, you know, had to go, go away for a week or two. But like, I've never seen anybody swing helmets before. I mean, you can kill somebody. So that's where it's like. I, should he be suspended? I don't know. Had he been suspended, I, I think dudes around the league would have been like, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, I don't think he should have been suspended. Practice, he'll never do it in the game. At least he has, and he's taking helmets off. But AFC West, mm. Wilson, Herbert, Mahomes, Carr. Mm. 
that division is unlike any division I believe we've ever seen mm -hmm. in the history of the league as far as quarterback talent in one division. I'm not even going to ask you to rank them and who would you take. Uh, well, I'll say this. At the end of the year, most people will agree that that's four of the top ten quarterbacks from this season. I'm putting Carr in there, too. Yeah, Carr is right at the – at least for Who's me. dealt with more bullshit in the last four years than Derek Carr? Nobody. Okay. We, we, we talk about A.B. and what happened at the end. We forget. They're in July. I think Carr is the most underrated quarterback in the league. I do, too. And, and the, has the, the most unwarranted pushback, even from his own fan base. Literally, when I'm when I'm walking and a Raider fan comes up and goes, "Hey, Jordan," and they want to talk, every I, I, like without a doubt, every single time, "Hey, honest opinion, Derek Carr is he a, is he a franchise quarterback?" And this is coming from a dude head to toe Raiders with probably a Raider tattoo on too. Like his own fan base questions him. And what I would say is like, go back to AB. Okay, it's not just the way AB left, right? With all the cameras rolling, right? It's that for the two years leading up to that, every year for the draft and I'm training guys for the draft, is this year John Gruden drafts his quarterback. So one, that's just happening. 24-7. Who are we going to replace? Are we going to take Kyler? Are we going to trade up and take Kyler Murray? Are we going to trade up and take this guy? So one, that's the foundation of it. Everyone's trying to get him out of there. Okay. Then you get A-B. And it's not just like losing A-B. It's that the whole offseason, you've designed it around having a Z who can do this, 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 and this. right? So you lose him in camp, and you lose him the way that they lost him, which is as chaotic as you can possibly have, right? Remember the phone call and he got it, he got released and he runs around the backyard and jumps Put in the pool. Put that shit on. Like, so, and you just lost your Z, okay? Then you lose Gruden and you don't, you didn't, it's not like they fired their coach week 10 and then the interim stepped up. It was complete chaos. You're talking about racial stuff. You're talking about the league. You're talking about one of the biggest faces of the NFL. This guy's been on Monday Night Football for a decade. So you, you didn't lose your coach. You lost Gruden. Right in the middle of the season, right? Then you got Basaccio or whatever, special teams guy takes over, he's doing everything he can. And then they go to the playoffs, right? Then you I add in rugs. Whatever player he was turning into or not turning into, right? They reached, took him. They had a bad draft too. They took Cleland Farrell, I don't even know his name, about fourth pick in the draft or whatever. So then you whiff on picks, right? You get rid of Cleo Matt. So you have all these pieces. It's like, man, all these good players are out. I lost my best receiver. I lost my coach. Then Rugs, and that's not you. I remember his interview. That's not a oh damn we lost Rugs. You know Derek. Seems way he like wears his faith on his sleeve. Like yes. he was the guy who went and saw him. You know yes. what I mean? Like so you're dealing with the heartache of this young man just ruined his entire life and killed somebody, right? So just all that stuff. Plus he's in the community. Plus he's involved in his church. Plus I think he's got four kids. I'm just saying like, I'm sorry nobody's been through as much bullshit as Derek Carr in the last five years, and everybody in Oakland or everybody in Vegas is trying to get rid of him. And he's looking at the playoffs last year and had to beat this young superstar, Justin Herbert, that everybody in Vegas would take over Derek Carr. If you could take Justin Herbert or Derek Carr, 100% of the Raider fan base would take Justin Herbert. And he beats him in the last game to go to the playoffs. So I'm sitting here going, man, they just added Renfro. Waller's going to be healthy. And they added Devontae. Finally, this dude's going to go off. And if, the problem is the original question. He's got to play Russ twice. Yeah. He's got to play Mahomes so, twice, and exactly. he's got to play Herbert twice. You train, or you have trained some of the best young quarterbacks in the league. Josh Allen, he, he's still young, but people would consider him a young veteran. Mm -hmm. You talk young guys, you talk Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence. Joe comes out and is just, man, leading up to the draft. Uh, you better demand a trade. You don't want to go to the Bengals. Tell them don't draft you. And... Takes the Bengals to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. It's like comes off an ACL injury and takes the Bengals to the Super Bowl. What do you make of how Joe, first let's talk Joe, has turned. I mean, he's literally turned Cincinnati around. I literally think they have a legitimate shot every year now of getting to the Super Bowl because of Joe, mm -hmm. his mentality. You agree? 100%. Man, I'm as connected to that. What's happened there is anybody. I mean, one, I played there for four years. It's the same people. It's different coaching staff, but whatever. It's the same ownership. It's Nick Cosgray doing rehab. It's Jeff Hobson interviewing you at your stool. I mean, it's so I intimately know that building, that organization. I intimately know this player, right? Been, been around him since college. I know what it takes to win there. I didn't just play there. I backed up my brother, who's the last guy to win there, right? And, and put up those types of numbers and have a top three offense 
a lot of those years, right? You, I'm not saying you don't intimately know this. You know it a whole different way. But like, I intimately know this entire situation. I still cannot believe in his second year he took him to the Super Bowl. I still can't believe that. And I'm not saying I didn't think it would ever happen. I just, I just not this real season. talk. I was like second year. Yeah. And um, it just shows you, you know, when a quarterback, when the when the organization takes on one player's mentality. It's the LeBron effect, right? When one player can actually shift those things. And it's not that those there weren't those other type of leaders. On, it's not to say that Jesse Bates didn't think dude, that stuff too. Dude, he's a too. different dude, man. Joe is different. Like, people, like, he's just, di- like, I've been around a lot of the quarterbacks you trained. Nobody acts like him. He's different, like, so. Some- so that, that, that can be true, but I've seen him in a kick it with, a bunch of dudes, not quarterbacks, like kick it with another quarterback I train and all his high school buddies in a hanging out setting. And everybody's like, I, when I met him, I thought, but man, he's cool as shit. So when it's time to work, he bought his no, business. No, like you're not going to find have- a single former teammate of his who doesn't forget the football side, doesn't love Joe, the guy, you know what I mean? So he's not a robot, right? He's not a drill sergeant. He's not yelling like, he can kick it and talk about hip hop and video. He's a gamer, like video game. Like he's, that's the one, two, two things happen when people meet Joe. One, they go, man, you're a lot taller than I thought. And then two, they go, man, you're cool as shit. You know what I mean? Or they say that guy was cool as shit. Joe's different. I don't know. They're all a little different. Right. And so for the way I see it, they're all, they're all different versions of the same thing. Um, but that that mentality, you know, you had Jamar in, had the same mentality, right? Because this this team, you th- got to think about, when they won the national title, we just buzzed past that and go, yeah, they were unbelievable on offense and they killed it and they were a great team. But hold on, when they were 6-0 and at, at LSU, no one in that building had ever been 6-0. and When they were 8-0, no one in that building had ever been 8-0. No. You know how easy it is for these young dudes, especially in New Orleans? Like, they got family who's like dapping them up and like, hey, you already made it, you're, you're going to the league and agents and all this stuff. Like, it's so easy to lose focus when you're not in an organization who wins it every year. The last time LSU was good was my year with Jamarcus. From 2007 to the year they won the title, it was whatever that is, 13 years of like, they're not that good. They got dudes going to the league. They got great players, but they're not like in it. They're not going to champion. I got to beat Bama. Nobody's picking them preseason to win it. They didn't pick them that year to win it. And so Joe, he had already had the experience of taking a team that had a lot of really good, talented players on the roster and an unproven new head coach and Coach Orgeron, he already did that, right? Yes, he played incredibly well, but everybody played him. He got that, something about that. So he already had a case study. He's just like, all right, we'll do that here. I look at the secondary. Eli Apple, that guy's really good. Oh, Jesse Bates, he's a baller. Oh, Sam Hubbard can rush the passer. What's your name? T, that guy can play. Add in Jamar Chase, who he's as confident. I mean, if Joe was the GM of the, of the Bengals and they had the number one pick that year, he'd have taken Jamar Chase with the number one pick. I mean, they they have two good. You got Joe Burrow and Joe Mixon. If they had the fourth pick, they would have taken Jamar over Kyle Pitts. Kyle Pitts went fourth to Atlanta. So I'm just saying, like, he knew exactly what he's, what he's getting into. He just did it two years ago, right? And I don't know that they wouldn't have had a crazy year like that as rookie year if he didn't tear his ACL seven weeks in. He was off to the hottest start in rookie, in rookie quarterback history. And so I, I just, when, when you have a player like him, when you say he's different, okay, but like, so's Aaron, so's Tom, so's Russ, so's Peyton. You know what I mean? Like, there's just different versions. They're their own version of what they think it's going to take for them to turn the thing around and get it going the direction they want. I'm just shocked that he did it with that team that early at that age. Actually, a good storyline, or it seems to be. And I, you'll see where I'm going with this. I look at his shoes. They're the color of the team I'm going to bring up. Baker Mayfield, uh, I like Sam Darnold because of you getting to know him. I think he's a hell of a person. I felt like when they traded for Baker, it wasn't a competition. They were giving Baker the starting job regardless. How do you think he plays this season, uh, considering the first game of the season, you're going against your old team? Can he... Yeah. Keep his composure. I mean, if I if I comment on how I think the competition went, there's going to be an assumption that that's because I because I talked to Sam. But we we already know but, that when they traded for Baker, 
he was going to be given a start. It yeah. was, it's not a competition. Yeah. I'll say that. And I don't even reason, talk to Sam. Yeah, it's the same reason they brought in Cam at the end. I mean, you got, okay, let's let's keep give this reason, this fan base a reason to continue to buy in. I also look at just what Tepper's doing. I mean, I saw something that he fired his, got a brand new soccer team, fired the head coach like six games into the, a brand new team. So it's like, this dude's wheeling and dealing right now. Right? Just swinging, right? They took a shot at Deshaun, didn't get it, right? So now you reach. This, unfortunately, this is the perfect offense for Sam. The way that Ben McAdoo does footwork, I, I talked to Aaron this offseason, I talked to Eli this offseason, all these guys who played for McAdoo, like it's perfect for Sam. So I'm heartbroken that he didn't get a chance to, or so far hasn't got a chance to be able to be the guy and do that. But in my opinion, to go get Baker, it was a, all right, Baker's our guy. Now justify it with playing, okay, cool, we'll roll forward. But shifting over to talk about how I think it's going to go for Baker, remove Sam from it, I, I like data points. I like looking backwards, right? When you're trying to predict something in the future. And you like behaviors. I like behaviors. Yeah. Um, that'll be a separate conversation. But but for this, like we know how Baker Mayfield responds when his back's against the wall and he's got a chip on his shoulder, he's been counted out. This guy went to two different colleges, okay? Both the head coaches at those colleges say, I got a hundred scholarships. I just don't have one for you. So he had to walk on twice. Okay. And then he was a Heisman finalist three times and won at once. So when everybody counts him out, I actually think you get the best Baker Mayfield. So then he goes to his rookie year, and he's offensive rookie of the year, whatever he was, great year, broke some touchdown record, all that stuff. Then what did he do that offseason? Broke, broke the NFL record for commercials in one year, right? I think he had a problem with success. I think he's world-class at handling adversity. I think he's had a problem dealing with success. Not really. A lot of times guys have success. And if they've never had it like that before, you can talk trash on them. You can say what you would do if you were them. But the reality is they're in a situation they've never been before. And a lot of us as human beings, we get put in a new situation. If we're not 100% sure how to handle it and we're, there's some, a fear of the unknown, it's hard for us to be confident in that situation. And all of a sudden, poof, you do or say something that you didn't really or – you, or you don't put the work in or, or whatever. You, you're not the best version of yourself. Everybody's been counted him out. Right. The amount of positive stories that have been written about Baker Mayfield in the last 12 years, I can count on one hand. Okay? Everybody's counted him out. And he is a guy who doesn't, I don't think he blocks out social media. I think he reads that shit. To some extent. I think he, he one way or another, I think he's the type of guy who probably hears it. Because he uses it as fuel. So, take Sam out of it. Now, looking at this, I, I think we're going to see some good ball out of Baker. If I just look back, when everybody's counted him out, has been when he's, at, when he's been at his best. And you don't get counted out more than a team trading to replace you, doing whatever they can to get rid of you for as cheap as possible, and there's only one place that really wanted them. That's as counted out as you can get for being a franchise number one pick five years ago. Quick one-liners before we let you go. If you don't want to answer it, don't answer it. Best arm in the league. Best arm in the league? Best arm. Josh Allen. Game on the line. Who you want as your quarterback? One drive. I'm going to say Pat just because the season ended the way that it did last year. 25 and under, who you starting your team with? Josh. Ah, I don't have one answer for that okay. one because right. I'd say Joe too. Okay. You're playing a Super Bowl. Who you want to be your starting quarterback? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the show has pretty much been quarterback heavy. Give me your top... Let's, let's say top 10 quarterbacks. And everybody goes top five. But I think once you get five, six, seven, eight, nine, they're interchangeable. Get, it does not have to be in any order. Yeah. That have to go one through 10. All right, I got to Give think me your it. top 10 quarterbacks. Let's get the easy ones out. Yes. Let's get Brady, Aaron, Josh, Pat, Joe. So there's five. Um, Russell's going to be in there. Uh, I'm going to put Stafford in there. The way that he's played, mm -hmm. not just this year, all those years in Detroit with nothing around him, the toughness, the playing in a team that you know is not that good, and the, but he was all. In I've anyways. always thought Stafford was. A I think really good I think I think Matt Stafford and Carson Palmer have been the same thing up until this point. You know what I mean? Number one pick, tiny market organization that's always lost, small fan base, and balled out in secrecy, <laughs> and then got a chance to go have a better run at the end. Carson ended at the NFC Championship. Matt's ended with a Super Bowl and with more to be played. Um, Derek Carr is going to be in my top 10, I think. Mm -hmm. Herbert's in there. 
I don't know where I'm at. Eight? That's, yeah, one more. All right, so what are my choices here? I got Lamar. I'm going Lamar. I got Dak Prescott. I'm going Lamar. Okay. TJ's going Lamar. Lamar got, is in the Let's just team. throw names out. So you, I haven't said Dak. I haven't said Lamar. I haven't said Kyler. I don't think Kyler has done what Lamar has done. So if Lamar's not in there, Kyler has I agree. no chance. I agree. It's probably Lamar, but I just want to go through who I've, who I've skipped because I probably just skipped somebody where it's like, oh, shit. Um, this just Matt Ryan's in there for me. Nah, Matt Ryan ain't better than Lamar Jackson. Not right now he isn't. Not for what each can bring to a team right now. And the fact that that's it's... A de- that's a debate for me. The fact that it's hard for you to name 10 quarterbacks just shows you the state of quarterbacks and how... Well, I, actually, I know who my 10th is, and I'm putting them above Lamar and Matt Ryan. And it, it is what it is. It's Deshaun Watson. Yeah. If he's, if he's able to be put on this list, it's Deshaun. I mean, there's so much been said about things outside of his football game. Dude, it's from day one. That guy came into the league and lit it up. Um, and hasn't had a bad year. And he led the his last season playing. He led the NFL in yards, and he didn't have anybody to throw to. No D hop that year. Brandon Cooks was okay. I mean, it, you know they were down. I mean, he led the NFL in yards. So uh, if he's got an asterisk or whatever the situation is, but player wise, he'd be in my. He, I'd put him above those guys. I have one more question for you as a quarterback. XFL just hired you, Director of Quarterback Development. Mm-hmm. For those that don't know, I told y'all this earlier. Best quarterback coach in the world out here. And I've been around him. He, he the best one out here. XFL just hired him. What's your role? What will you be doing? The quarterbacks that are in the XFL, you guys are going to be lucky to have him as a Director of Development. Um, explain, how did that come about when you start? Um, yeah. All the particulars. I'm excited, man. Um, if you think, if me and Dwayne Johnson both took our shirts off, we would have nothing in common, right? But we do have one thing in common in that we needed a league like this, right? He got replaced by Warren Sapp at, at the U, right? And got a cup of coffee and bounced around. Like he needed, he needed a league where you could go and develop and actually get better. Not a place to practice, not a a, a league that will provide you uniforms and coaching, but like literally get better and a platform to go play against other good players with really good coaches. I needed the same thing. When I got cut after my rookie year, I signed with the Arizona Rattlers. The day before I leave, my truck was packed. The day before I leave, I signed with Cincy. And then when Carson demands a trade and I got cut and I was working out for all these teams, I ended up signing with the United Football League, not even around anymore. Denny Green, the late Denny Green, was my coach. So I'm sitting here going, oh, man, I get to play for an NFL coach? I was there for two days. And I called my agent. I'm like, get me out of here. This is a joke. Sacramento? Sacramento Mountain Lions. Yeah. Get me out of here. This is a joke. I'm going to get worse and hurt, right? So now since then, right, the spring league, I called games for Fox a few years ago and called a lot of the spring league. Um, that's now the USFL. We've seen the AAFL, whatever, come and go. What, what I love about this, and I've seen a lot of these things come and go. I've played in I've been under contract with two of them, is this led by Russ Brandon, Doug Whaley. Russ Brandon was with the Bills for 20 years. Doug Whaley was Russ a GM. Russ Brandon was with, he was in Seattle when I was there too. Okay. Yeah. So the 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 way that the, they're looking at the league from a development standpoint, developing coaches, developing referees, developing players, all of it, and the way that they want to approach the quarterback position um, got me really excited and, and early in the conversations was like, it's very clear these guys are going to do it. And then let me bring Dwayne Johnson back into it. Name something that guy blew up and shouldn't have never done and was a disaster. I don't call him that Dwayne, dude, just say The Rock. The Rock, yeah. that guy doesn't lose, right? And he also doesn't do anything that he's not full on promoting, right? I think he's arguably the biggest social media, has the biggest social media following in the world, right? And he promotes and he puts his name out there. So his name is on this as much as it's on anything. As it pertains to the football world, his name's on this more than anything. So that, his partner, Danny Garcia, like the leadership of it, we don't know who the quarterbacks are yet. We don't know who the, you know, kick returner is going to be for the Houston. Fr- that stuff's going to get settled out. But the, the leadership at the top and the development. So what I'm going to be coming in is working with all eight teams and curating a development program for these quarterbacks. So September, October, November, December, the offseason, 
Every quarterback on the roster is getting sent out to me in Southern California, and we have phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. All the stuff that you've seen me do with draft training and with my NFL veterans, now when you're under contract with the XFL, you get full-blown access oh, to come out to me. Y'all going to get y'all lucky. They're going to get a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll curate that with the team. So I'm not a quarterback coach. I'm not going to be you know, on, this, on the sideline telling him where to throw it. Uh, I have no connection to the, the playbook. I want their coaches to coach them. Um, and offensive coordinators to weigh in on those things. But from a development standpoint, where I focus on the movement and the mechanics, now, those two things be, will get better. Will it be every quarterback in the league or yeah. just the starting quarterback? No, it'll be every quarterback because we don't know who the starter is going to be in the offseason. And so part of that's a competition element. And then I'll be like, like during the year right now. How I've, did this come about? Like, I, got, I, I just got approached by them. Okay. So. Um, when you're the best, that people want to be with the best. It and, makes sense. and so what I do a lot of times during the season right now, I had three this morning, is I'm Zooming with NFL and college quarterbacks. In some cases, the quarterback and the quarterback coach and the coordinator and the strength coach. And we're curating what we've been doing this offseason, how to add that into individual period and practice, during special teams period and practice, after practice, what's the quarterback going to work on for 10 or 15 minutes. We curate that program. I'm watching practice tape on 15 different teams right now. I have access to their practice. So I'm watching practice, curating what the quarterback needs to work on next week. So we'll be able to take that into it. So rem- like because of COVID and, Zoom, and every kid learning how to Zoom, uh, remote coaching is like a real thing. I mean, during the season, I'm going to be spending, you know, j- with just college and NFL clients, you know, 20 hours a week between watching tape and then com- uh, cur- curating the curriculum for the year. There you go. Best quarterback in the game. Best quarterback trainer in the game. Jordan Palmer. Definitely not the best quarterback in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Fubo Sports Network appreciate you guys uh, first ever episode Orlando <laughs> we missed you bro we don't know where you at hopefully him feel better but Jordan Palmer man appreciate you he my dog we work together been working together gonna keep working together y'all better come get this great training if y'all knew better you would do better holla at your boy we out we out